Welcome to today's webinar, Measuring Australia's Coastal Property Risks, uh, which FINCI is running in partnership with CoreLogic. Uh, I'm Lewis Panther, Head of Corporate Affairs and Communications at FINCIA. But before we get started, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which each of us is participating in this webinar. Though we physically be far and wide, each of us is on the land of the traditional owners, and I would like to pay my respect to elders past and present and any future any First Nations people with us today. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Pierre Wyatt, Head of Consulting and Risk Management, Asia Pacific Core Logic. Pierre is a Senior Global Risk Transfer Director with over 20 years experience in all aspects of risk transactions, including reinsurance, underwriting and enterprise risk management. He leads CoreLogic's consulting and risk management team in Australia and New Zealand with a focus on climate risk and risk management strategies and solutions for insurance, banking and government sectors. He's a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, a senior associate of ANZIF, the Australian and New Zealand Institute of Insurance and Finance, and holds a PhD in physical geography. In today's session, we'll discuss the impacts of climate change on coastal property and how it will continue to have significant long-term impacts for residents, insurers, and lenders. We look at the implications of coastal erosion on the property market and the financial sector, including property valuation, bank loan viability, and insurance premiums. And for the session, uh, the way we're going to run it is that Pierre will present for around 40 minutes. Following this, we'll open up to questions. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we may not get through all the questions, so we will take some of them on notice after the webinar. Uh, as we're still uh, uh, having the tailwinds of the pandemic and we're in different locations, apologies if the Q&A is not as seamless as it might otherwise be. If one of us drops out, be patient. If that happens, we will do our best to get things and uh, reconnect. So without further delay, I will uh, now hand over to Pierre. Yeah, welcome and thank you. Thank you, uh, Lewis. <clears throat> Let me uh, start to share my screen. And hopefully you can see uh, the full screen. So yes, thank you, um, um, Lewis, and uh, thank you everyone to uh, to join us today to talk about uh, coastal risks, uh, which is organized uh, with the help of uh, Fincia. So thank you for doing so. Um, CoreLogic has just uh, recently published an article regarding coastal risks, and uh, so we're taking this opportunity to uh, use this webinar to go perhaps a little bit uh, further than than the paper and to show and to illustrate what we think. It is a, an interesting and relevant topic uh, to the financial industry and obviously uh, at, at a wider scale uh, for the, all the communities. First, I'd like to uh, also to thank the, uh, all the team that worked uh, on uh, handling a lot of data, as you can imagine. So uh, all the members of uh, the CoreLogic Data Analytics, uh, Benjamin Hart, Anna Russell, and Lachlan Byatt. Um, just wanted to acknowledge their work as well. So like, like me, I guess you would have been able to read articles in the press um, from time to time over the last few years, specific to uh, obviously uh, local news sometimes, and where obviously some of these houses or properties would have been impacted by, uh, uh, by storm or, or, or by high surge and uh, pointing out the, the vulnerability of some of these properties, which some of them are very, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, healthy uh, properties uh, for the market. So with that, those two images here, just to show the Coleroy um, storm surge that we uh, observed in a couple of, uh, on a couple of occasions, and also just uh, recently in, in uh, Queensland, south of, uh, Calandra, there is a, the Bribey Island where the a channel has been created. That's that's just back in January. So that's very uh, 
those examples are here just to remind you that it's happening as, as we speak. It's not uh, an occasional uh, um, event that we see. And in, in fact, we'll, we'll come back to Koroi and uh, Burby Island in, in a minute, but just to show the, uh, the extent of uh, the impact of uh, coastal erosion, we've collected a lot of uh, articles and, and press articles that relate uh, local uh, issues with, uh, with coastal risks, either by uh, some uh, properties being at risk or by some part of the, of the beach being removed, and uh, it's and here that map is just just capturing all the locations that we uh, we noticed. Um, it's just to show the extent actually of uh, the concern and 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 what we uh, we as a community as a society we are we should be uh, concerned about. So let's go back to the uh, Coloroy event, if I may say. It has been well reported in the press. It's been, it's quite spectacular. If you would have seen some of the images of uh, some of these houses falling into the water, if I may say. So uh, the first event started in, in June, 2016, during a large windstorm. And part of the beach has been completely taken away up to a distance of 50 meters. So it's something very significant that impacted Koroi. And uh, wind storms uh, and storm surge are events which are happening currently along the east coast of Australia due to the uh, east low uh, uh, meteorological conditions that, that we observe. And from time to time, the beaches are being impacted. And again, it happened in, in February 2020 um, to the point that uh, in January 2022, they, um, they have uh, a local wall, I mean, a uh, a wall funded by, by private funds uh, was built. Uh, and that solution, uh, uh, which might be the best, by the way, we, uh, is also raising some eyebrows in the rest of the communities. So these, these phenomenon are obviously impacting everyone uh, locally. Looking now at another example at uh, Calandra, uh, as I said, off Calandra, there is a, a, a small sand bar, as there are so many uh, all around Australia. And um, following uh, in December 2020, there was already some a, a lot of uh, uh, during a, a storm, a lot of large waves that that uh, overtopped, if I may say, the island and created a, a small channel. And then uh, with the remnant of Cyclone Seth uh, in January, this little breach, if I may say, started to open widely, creating a, a brand new channel and, and cutting the island in, in two. Um, and we'll come back to that in later on in this presentation. But these examples are just here to illustrate how dynamic actually uh, the uh, coastline is around Australia. And, uh, and it's, it's happening as in front of us as, as uh, as we can see. So the idea uh, is to uh, being able to understand those risks. And um, while there are a lot of uh, specific studies, which are very specific to some local area, uh, from our perspective, CoreLogic, we're a data company. We've got a lot of data on, on the properties, the geographies. And what we wanted to do is being able to uh, assign, ultimately, a view of that risk for each and every property, obviously along the coastline of Australia. So we took into account, obviously, various factors, uh, the impact of storm surge, as we've, we've seen in, in Coleroy, uh, which we define in terms of distance and obviously in terms of elevation. Uh, we also looked at the dynamic of the coastline, and we've been using some, some data from uh, Joe Science Australia and that we'll discuss in a minute. And obviously there is this debate about the uh, long-term sea level rise. Now we've been using these three decades of data from uh, Geoscience Australia. And so they themselves, they embedded, it's embedded uh, the, um, the sea level rise factor. So in our approach actually is, uh, takes that into account, but it could be more conservative. We could have been, we could have pushed further using various scenarios. 
but I think that would be um, for, for a later version. First, we want to um, take a snapshot of what's happening as of today. So I mentioned that we've got, uh, we've been using data from uh, the Digital Earth uh, Australia, a website uh, owned by uh, Geoscience Australia, and they've got this great data, which actually is the uh, coastline um, all over, all around Australia for the last uh, three decades. So as you can see on that slide, the colors correspond to the year. Uh, and um, what is interesting in this specific example, which is on, on, also on their website, what is interesting on that image is you can, you've got two stories. You've got a story on the right part of the image and a story on the left side of the image. Um, this is actually a broad water in Western Australia for those who are wondering where we're looking at. On the, um, on the right side, what we see is, um, is the fact that the coastline is effectively growing, it's, it's, uh, it's growing into the sea, if I may say. On the other hand, on the left side, we can see that the <clears throat> coastline has been retreating uh, over time, over the last decade. And it is quite obvious on that image, the amount of the distance effectively that the, the retreat of the coastline uh, um, has been. So we use all this data um, and there is obviously projected points that shows the, the rate uh, all along the coastline. So in order to integrate that into a, a meaningful scaling system, if I may say at property level, we, um, we ultimately looked at that rate of retreat. So we were interested very much in the retreat rate, not of the growing rate for, for uh, in order to establish coastal risks. So we looked at the retreat rate and we also looked at the distance for each and every property in comparison to that retreat rate. And that's how we come up with, if you want, an erosion rate, which is uh, expressed in years, because that's that's what it's left in, in, in the equation, if I may say, is just the amount of time for property to be impacted by that retreat. Surely then there would be um, some differences here and there all around the coastline. There might be some man-made defenses. Uh, so to be clear, study do not take all these points into account but just a way to have a methodology <clears throat> so how does it look using using certain, only the uh, retreat rate that's the uh, that's one map to show um, the um, places where the retreat rate is one of the greatest and how much the uh, coastline has moved <clears throat> so places like East Mike K uh, are, are, are in fact very, um, we can see the shore retreating very rapidly up to seven meter per year. Now it doesn't mean that there's a straight correlation with the risk because there might be a large distance between the retreat rate and, and the shore. So we had to take that into account as well. So our composite coastal risks integrates, as I say, the erosion rate, and we broke it down in terms of number of years before a property will be impacted. And we decided that 30 years is a very high risk. And the decision of taking 30 years is very much linked to the, um, to the financial um, institutions and thinking of, of, of loan effectively where people might take on a loan for 20 up to 30 years. And so in this, uh, if your house can be impacted by coastal risks uh, within 30 years, then therefore your asset is at very high risk indeed. And that's how we define the band. So it is um, a way to establish the different the relativity between the risks in our classification. 
it can be uh, changed, it can be amended, but the point is to be able to have a, a consistent method throughout all the properties around Australia. So let's go back to our example and, and the focus we had on, on uh, Coroy so far. How does it look now? Well, on that map, you will see all the dots represent houses. And obviously the color is linked to the uh, composite risk score. And so that score, as I say, take into account distance elevation. Um, and if, if it is uh, noted, the retreat rate. Again, where we can see what is classified as very high risk is very much uh, the area where the the recent uh, sea wall has been built near, near, near Stuart Street, but also where we would have seen the damages in 2016 and 2020. Uh, the Colorado Hotel also, for instance, is an iconic place and it's been also impacted through the storms. So it's just a concrete way to test if you want that the methodology works and provides some meaningful um, scoring. We've looked at other places, but just to, um, <clears throat> to notice the, uh, the amount, the value which is at risk through our method, given that we've got the scoring on a per property basis, we're able to count the number of individual houses, the number of apartments, and obviously number of drillings uh, that are impacted by, uh, that could be impacted by coastal risks. And we can also establish the overall value, which is at risk. And we come back actually to the, to the value along the coastline later on in, in this presentation. Another example, Wimberall, I know it's been also uh, uh, noted in, in, in the press, there's been a lot of discussion about the risks in Wimberall, and that's uh, also being, um, that's how it looks in our scoring system and the overall value, which is at risk. And finally, another example, back to our Calundra example that we've seen at the beginning of the, the talk. Remember, we've seen this uh, channel being created um, with the new storms. And what we can see is that the property which are facing now that channel are obviously much more at risk, um, letting more water being probably pushed on through a storm surge. So we'll, we'll make a little, uh, little pause right now. We've got a, a poll and um, we'll be interested to know from you as a lender, perhaps, what is your biggest concern with growing coastal risks? Um, is it implementing appropriate hardship measures? <clears throat> is it managing risk exposures and impacted assets? Well, you want to be proactive at supporting and helping your customers, of course. And obviously addressing climate change impact for your company might be also your, your choice. So I would give you a few minutes to uh, <clears throat> feel that poll. So thank you for, uh, for, uh, for looking at the, at the poll. So uh, the, the highest concern uh, from, from this audience is very much managing risks, exposure, and impacted assets indeed. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's the goal of, of our data is being able to report that on a, on a, for each and every property around Australia. But obviously being able to uh, support customers is, is relevant uh, and it's inscribed into the overall climate change discussion. Very good. Thank you for, for uh, providing your feedback.
Now let's uh, let's carry on a little bit the, the discussion here. So we were we were able to um, look at uh, the places which we which are of concern, and one of the uh, aspect also that needs to be noted in terms of wealth is um, is obviously the closer you are to uh, not obviously but what we noticed in in throughout obviously Australia is the closer you are to the beach um, often the property value is increasing as well so it's a bit of a, a, a double whammy if I may say equation where the, the closer you are the more at risk you are but also the highest the higher the value is at risk and just to put things in uh, perspective here, here, this example is for Mermaid Beach. We thought it was a nice example, a clean example to show you the correlation between uh, the price of a, of a standard three bedroom house uh, uh, and its distance relative to the shore. <clears throat> what is important to realize is it's not just in Mermaid Beach. I mean, overall, 10% of all residential drillings are within uh, one, one kilometer of the coastline in Australia. So uh, it's, it's a lot of assets along the coast, about one trillion of uh, residential wealth, ultimately. So how does it look from a national view, if I may say, and, and with a look now from a on a per state basis. <coughs> Excuse me. This slide shows the number of uh, properties ultimately being pacted, and the color is linked to the very high uh, uh, risk um, to uh, and also the high risks scores. Um, in red, uh, it's the houses, and blue, that's that's the apartments. Queensland is obviously uh, the state which has the most property along the shore, which are at the high risks and, and overall, which are most probably uh, 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 subject to coastal risks. Probably with, without, a, without a surprise really, um, but it just confirms the fact. It doesn't mean that the other states are, 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 are not also concerned. In fact, New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania, to have the same amount, roughly speaking, of, uh, of poverty is being at very high risk. Another view, perhaps, it's to look at some of, uh, to classify, if you want, the number of, uh, uh, from a suburb perspective, um, we ranked here the suburbs with the most poverty at risk. We can see that the top two ones are in Queensland in, on the Gold Coast area. And then we've got a, a few on, on the Morton Bay um, area. Uh, interestingly, Port Lincoln in, um, in South Australia is also, uh, is also there. Uh, we've got also Mindoree, which is the northern part of Perth, uh, which rank as well. So I won't go through the, the list and one by one, but it's just to say they are, <clears throat> they are dispatched all around uh, the country. There are interesting ones like Townsville and, and Manly, where the, the risks are very high, but they concern uh, mainly, I would say, apartments, uh, buildings. Mm. And on the other side, places like Lauderdale in Tasmania, where we do have only, only uh, single houses, um, which are very high risk ultimately. So there is a, in this data, there's a lot, a lot to learn and, and a lot to pick. And that, that's why ultimately it's a whole database where you need to effectively look on a, on a per poverty basis. In terms of uh, value at risk, here is another another graph, and here we've um, we've represented all the suburbs with most um, building being at risk, ranked with uh, the high risk, which is this red bars, if you want. <clears throat> the first thing is 
uh, that we can see is that Paradise Point on the Gold Coast, which was topping our previous table, is again there. And, uh, and the overall value at risk is just absolutely way beyond anything else on that table. We will come back to that in a second to understand a bit better why. Meanwhile, we've got, we've got uh, places from, again, uh, all around Australia with uh, places in, in, uh, in Port Phillip Bay, like Kinspindle and Brighton. Uh, we've got a uh, Wimberall in New South Wales, along with Coleroy. No surprise here, if I may say. Um, but we do see uh, all, all these different places in various states. Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, topping up this, uh, this, this, this type of uh, um, the amount of wealth being at risk. So why did the Paradise Point in, uh, on the Gold Coast uh, come up in our, in our data analysis? Well, we, we looked at it a bit more, uh, obviously, closely. Um, and uh, we've got some satellite images to show how that, that little island uh, is, is clearly a man-made place um, out of some of the uh, sandbars that were there uh, a long time ago. So it's all brand new. Uh, you know, here's an image of 1973, and there was hardly anything, 1989. And then so on. And that's how obviously we, we picked it up for obviously um, all the criteria of our selections do ring a bell here. If you look on the uh, on the left, I mean the image is all this property, they all have access to the water. It's obviously designed for it, uh, but that means obviously all of these properties are, are at greater risks because they are straight into the into the water. Um, and so the risk is great, and there wouldn't be too much for, uh, for this property to, um, if there is a storm, uh, and if the water is pushed toward them, to be impacted. Also, interestingly, on that place is the uh, staggering amount of each and every property. Uh, they are high-end high, high, uh, uh, property, uh, which are all very expensive and so much that it is one of the highest uh, concentration of wealth all around Australia. <clears throat> so perhaps in order to, uh, to wrap up the, the discussion and to take on some questions, here is a list of um, the, the, the same graph, I may say, or the, the same um, that the table that we've looked at, listing all the um, suburbs, with the amount of uh, wealth being uh, at risk. So in order to, uh, to, to close this discussion or this presentation, I should say, but we'll take on some questions. Um, those risks go really, they are, there's a real use um, from, a, from a lender's perspective and especially from the credit risks aspect, uh, it can start to, uh, to be used readily. Um, uh, in in um, in the credit risk equation to see what what could be uh, impacted by coastal risks and um, if there might be a, a risk on the long term basis, it would help property valuation. It would also uh, it could also help uh, in terms of education to have a discussion with the owner and to see how they want to uh, to uh, address that problem. Uh, it won't happen overnight. We we know that, or it could. In, in, on, on, on some very rare occasions, but all, otherwise it's, it's a long, long trend uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, so there are many applications also in the insurance sector uh, to, uh, to be able to pinpoint what, what needs to be addressed on the long-term basis. So with that, I mean, I, I noticed that there are quite a few questions, so uh, I'm aware of the time. I think it's uh, perhaps the right time to take on some questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, it's, having read uh, your white paper uh, earlier this week, um, watching the webinar, 
really brought it live. I think it um, shows it's uh, it, it's great to have that kind of personal connection. And, and as you can see, we are getting a, a fair few questions coming through. So um, I'll um, I'll I'll pick through them uh, and uh, I've had a look already and see if there are any uh, that, that uh, are along a theme. But um, the, the first one was uh, from uh, Beth Patterson, who wanted to uh, uh, ask about the, um, the map data set you're using, if you're able to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's reference. You, uh, you, you, you can go to the DEA website. Uh, it's dea.ga.gov.au. Um, straightforward. Okay, um, and, and that was following on from that. Another sort of uh, methodology, methodology questions is um, how, if you do assess the vulnerability of different building types. So no, this methodology is very much to address and to assess the risks, the potential risks. Um, it's true that vulnerability, vulnerability can be taken into account in terms of obviously how the building is is made and and. And uh, uh, we appreciate that often uh, if you close very, if you build very closely to the sea, you might have been thinking of, of, a, of, a, of a solid or, or uh, a sturdy way uh, to build your house. So um, no, this methodology is, is more to understand the risks on the same basis. Okay, and that, that, I, I think that's, uh, sure that's answered the question of that uh, uh, member. Um, Peter Hooker has asked um, about second order effects. Um, he's talked about pit water road in Colorado, um, and asked about the, the, whether the root of the road needs to change in parts. Uh, he says, even if my property is coded green on the west side of the road, the amenity on, is on the other side and may still be threatened. Is that something that is um, um, taken into account in, in the scorecard? So we, we, we take into account, uh, as I said, some of the parameters. Uh, there are some subtlety that we do appreciate um, locally. Um, and so uh, perhaps in regards to the locations of amenities or, or um, specific buildings, we, do, uh, we, we have not taken that into account at that stage. It, it could be uh, it could be potentially uh, be implemented on, on future uh, versions. Because this is I mean this is the first time that this has actually been done, isn't it? This uh, to this degree that um, you, you've looked at it as, as a as a as a as an overall uh, coastal risk for Australia. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, a question that uh, had cropped up uh, from a couple of areas is. Um, uh, whether it's um, storm surges and their frequency uh, that's more important than the gradual erosion. Have you been able, is there, is there a differentiation or do you put, put more weight on one or the other? So, so no, we don't have a, a real weight. What we, uh, but what we've done is to acknowledge that depending on where you are along the coastline, the problem is different. And, and that's why we really wanted to grasp here in this uh, overall uh, scoring. We, we didn't want to have uh, to address just storm surge or just the erosion. We just wanted to grab everything. And so that score, which in itself is just a, is just a, a scaling uh, a scale, if you want to, to evaluate the, 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 the risk, uh, is here as uh, to raise a flag to show that there is a concern regarding coastal risks and locally there might it might be uh, from either the, the, the erosion itself or, or the proximity to uh, storm surge effects. I'll, I'll follow that one then from uh, a question from David Thomas who asks um, if this is this uh, score is being applied by lenders in credit restoring and insurers um, is this happening yet? So it has just been released. Uh, okay. So uh, any interest probably... so far? Well, hopefully we'll. Um, uh, I'm sure the webinar will uh, uh, encourage some people. Um, one of the things I was interested in, and um, I don't think there was as many pictures in in the report, but when you you showed, um, you know, you, it brings it home to you the the, the seawall at Colroy, um, and and we know of these things happening in other parts of the world. Um, are they effective? in mitigating this kind of risk? Is that something you can comment on? 
So, I mean, for, for us, CoreLogic is, is very much a, a data company. Um, we, we're not even an engineering company, if I may say. Uh, you, you really have to ask engineers and, and people who do know what is the best structure and how effective they are. Um, so it would be a little bit, uh, it's, it's a little bit too far-fetched for us to be able to comment really at that okay. level. We are getting, it's a testimony to uh, how, uh, uh, how interested people are. I, I don't think I've seen as many questions in, in a webinar that we've had in the last so many years. So um, um, from Nicholas Harris, um, he says, do you believe uh, a research exercise could be applied for flooding risk in New South Wales and Southeast Queensland? I guess he's referring to more inland um, uh, events that we're again seeing that are, uh, are right in front of us. Right, so flood in itself is obviously a, a different, uh, a little bit different from coastal risks. Uh, flood can be uh, generated by, um, in different ways. The main common one is, is rivers that, that do swallow and, and uh, bridge their, their bed and obviously flood the area that says river flooding. Uh, it's one of the main common flood. Um, but there could be also what we call flash flood, which is uh, a downpour of a lot of water unexpectedly in one, one specific location. And the water somehow is, is, is trapped effectively and create some local floods, uh, which was actually observed recently uh, uh, on the northern beaches as well. So, um, so these two type of floods um, can happen everywhere in Australia. Obviously, a river flood is linked to having a river nearby. Uh, and flash flood is is due to downpour of water. I mean, at CoreLogic, we've got we've got some data independently from that research uh, about flood risks, and and we do provide uh, uh, again some uh, scoring system regarding flood uh, throughout uh, all over Australia. Okay. Um, for, this is from Asif Nua. Thank you, Asif. Um, hi, Pierre. We know a lot of these properties are usually listed as premium ones. How do you perceive them in the long term, given water is rising and risk and the risk with these becoming imminent uh, from global warming? So indeed, that, that's one of the uh, of, of one of these questions that um, a lot of people would like to be able to, to answer. It's it's uh, it will take a bit of time. Obviously, uh, global warming is is a, is a slow process, uh, but it's, it's happening. I mean, uh, we, we are. Um, we are referring, obviously, uh, from the work from the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change. So uh, that's where we took our, our um, knowledge on, on what would happen in terms of climate change, which is widely accepted by the scientific community. Um, so in terms of impact on two properties, uh, it will, there might be some impact and there will be some impact on the long term uh, if... if um, you can imagine if, if you are buying a new house, uh, new or not, but if you're buying a, a, a property uh, next to the sea and you take on a, a loan on the long term and uh, through time there is an impact, there is a retreating coastline or, or, uh, or your, your property is damaged from a storm surge, then your asset is uh, losing value. So there is a real risk here. And I think um, it needs to be taken into account and, um, and to be discussed and, and see um, and recognize, I guess, ultimately by the communities. And uh, let's follow that um, with uh, Honora Corbett uh, asking uh, again, uh, um, how vulnerable are the stone seawalls in Sydney Harbour to rising sea level and or storm surges? Is that something that... Um, you could comment on? Um, so again, I mean, those, I guess those, uh, for Cologic, is it a bit difficult to, to comment on those uh, infrastructure and in engineered uh, solutions? Uh, they would have been done by, by expert uh, opinion, expert engineers. And so uh, we believe that, I mean, if, if they would have done that, uh, it's big. But one thing I will say, they would have obviously had a, could be done. So, um, 
I should try to weed out the engineering questions uh, and um, uh, come back to uh, um, the risk. Um, before I go, John O'Sullivan has asked, are there consolidated approaches to mitigation being taken between local and state government, or, or is it case by case in what you are seeing? Hmm. Yes, that actually it's... Um... It's interesting is how, how do you uh, approach uh, a solution from a global perspective or national level? Um, and, and that is, I think, a little bit difficult from the data we looked at. It looks like there are a lot of different type, if I may say, of, uh, of um, different type of solutions that could be, uh, that could be done uh, for specific uh, lo localities uh, and locations around the country. So. Um, both both uh, ideas are good if there could be a, a way to uh, start to think on how to do that at a national level but also as i said uh, local uh, 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 discussions between communities and and councils are also uh, worth it okay um from david try um from public policy perspective he says uh, how do we stop the problems of these properties being socialized uh, what intervention is possible to discourage developments in such locations that's um more of a policy question than analysis maybe yes it is it is a, a policy question um how to put that in place um is it the case you're giving them the data and it's for them to use, should I perhaps say at this stage, because it brings me on to another question from James, who asks about a particular place that he lives at, um, uh, that you featured and, uh, and he asks you, uh, should he sell? So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think um, the, the answer is, um, you know, um, and now we're still getting um, many, many more questions. There's one I wanted to ask that uh, came and, and has it's actually gone past me and it's about do you take do you um um do you differentiate between um uh, inland islands and the the external coastal erosion that you you know where you pointed out at that um uh, behind behind surface paradise yes so we we tried to uh obviously there would be some some effects uh, so what we noticed in our methodology is with uh, when you've got a say a sandbar an island or some kind of uh, protection it seems uh, obviously there's no no real impact of uh, what we call coastal retreat uh because it has been fairly static um um over the years but it doesn't mean that uh there is no risks because ultimately we, we as a society tend to build properties right, right, right at the water level, and uh, and we know that it, they don't need much to be uh, overtopped by water. Um, so around the um, uh, Brisbane, what we, I mean, the whole Gold Coast and, and Sunshine Coast, what we can comment on is there are, as we know, uh, not very often, but it could happen that we do have tropical cyclones. And those uh, storms, very powerful storms, they would be able to push a lot of water uh, above and beyond uh, what we uh, what wouldn't uh, uh, sandbars and, and also top over properties, small walls. So um, you could imagine a scenario where a storm surge would uh, created by a tropical cyclone would create a lot of damages to those properties. And, and a question um, sort of, um, along those lines and, and about the development of property, um, you, you've taken the data for the last three decades that shows the, the, you know, the, the retreat, sometimes the movement of the sandbars. Have you also looked at whether there's been an increase in uh, property being built closer to um, the shoreline over that period? Obviously, there's been um, uh, you know, massive increases in property prices in certain areas over the, over the past few years. Uh, and as, as we know, you know, most Australians like to be near the water. Um, you know, as it, as it, I don't want to be punny here, become a perfect storm between uh, what's happening in the natural world and, and what's happening um, 
you know, uh, in, in the community? So yeah, the, the, um, it's a good question and the answer is, is yes, absolutely. There would have been uh, more development along the coastline uh, in the last few decades. So there's a lot of factors all you know, um, uh, converging, if I may say, to the fact that it has increased coastal risks. Um, we've been building more properties, we've been building more expensive properties, we've been putting, um, we, we as a society have been getting closer, if you want, to the risk. There is no doubt about it. And that's uh, um, a question, and well, that's something to be taken into account by the, the people watching this um, um, when they judge the, the risk uh, scorecards they'll be coming out with. Um, we have a question here from an anonymous attendee asking about analysis in future, including low lying areas near any bodies of water within the reach of capital cities. Uh, it says uh, Sydney, for example, harbour sides, river sides, Perth, sub suburbs, and any la lake examples, Joondalup and Wembley. Um, do we know, I mean, in your experiences, you know, in risk, um, is there greater attention to this being, you know, being undertaken at the moment? So um, we haven't been too much um, inland, and by inland, what we define inland is is, is quite remote from the coast. Um, so I can see also some some questions regarding inside the the, the various harbors. Could be could be uh, in Sydney, it could be elsewhere. So we 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 don't go. We we didn't go too far inland. I mean, we we as I said, the study restricted to uh, uh, to the first few hundred. Uh, meters. So, um, so, so it's not a. It, it might it, one might say that it's not uh, complete in terms of getting right into uh, some of the river uh, uh, estuaries and, and so on. So uh, uh, there might be also some risks there. Um. I was interested to see when you showed the uh, imagery around the, the retreat, but um, um, a, lot, a, short, a short distance away, there was the coastal expansion, which um, you said you didn't take into consideration, obviously, because it was expanding. But it, it, it's, you know, we um, shifting sands in, in those kind of low lying areas. Is, is that something that we are seeing? Um, it, is it important to? Um, to look at what, what is happening there as well? Sure, I mean, if, if it is a low-lying uh, area, very close to the water, uh, that, that should ring a bell. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, the frequency of the risk is very high, but perhaps um, it, should be, it should be assessed. I'm thinking of, uh, of this suburb in, in, in Tasmania, south of Hobart in uh, Lauderdale, it's a smaller uh, isthmus, uh, like we've got along the coastline, like perhaps like in Manly, and there is no doubt that you know you you are close to the water on 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 two sides uh, effectively. So uh, it doesn't need too much of a of a storm of a water being pushed to obviously being impacted. From that, I think this follows on quite well. Uh, that, that Mark Cooter has asked. Um, and he asks about if there's a graph of the time and sea surge levels um, and, and, and what impact that has. He, he looks, says, for example, eight meter surge could be fine in 20, uh, 2022, but by 2032, uh, you may need to have a, a, a 10 meter differential. Um, are they the kind of thing, are you, I may be asking more engineering questions here, but is that something that you've uh, looked into or thought about? Uh, when it comes to the risks that we're facing. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been thinking of that. It's a very good point, actually. It's true that uh, what we see as of today might not be the picture in, in 30 years. Um, and to do that, that means setting up some uh, assumptions or, or uh, uh, um, you know, uh, assuming that sea level has risen by X amount um, in, in centimeters. Um, and that plus the combination of a higher surge would obviously increase ultimately uh, 
the, the height that, um, that the water could impact. So um, we've been thinking about it. At this point for this first uh, version, we've been just using the data as we, uh, as we know it, as we got it. Uh, perhaps it's, it's a good point for a future version is to have uh, some scenarios and projections of what could happen. It also does make me wonder. Um, I know that you've, you know, the, the, the timelines that you looked at, you know, and, and the start off for the very high risk is the 30 years and it starts tied in with a, a, a you know, a mortgage a timeline. Uh, but it, it does strike me that, and, and from the interactions we've had over the last few years, and the interest in, in and problems coming out of, of climate change and, uh, and, and attendant coastal erosion. The, 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 these timelines are shrinking. Um, I, I, does, do, is that something that is there at front of mind for, for you and Core Logic as you look at this? And you know, could we could that shrink to, to, to a much shorter period of time? So, for all the questions um, linked to future climates, really, we we um, we, we just um, take that from the. Um, IPCC and, and the various scenarios that are discussed also in the finance world, uh, which are recommending, recommended through the TCFD, uh, what also the regulators are advising. And all these scenarios, future scenarios, are all coming from uh, the overall uh, International Panel of Climate Change, uh, and they're coming up with those future scenarios. So we do have, perhaps not for the costs or risks, but for flood, and uh, we do have scenarios on future projections that follow those recommended uh, scenarios. Okay. Um, where are we with the questions as well? Uh, the other the, the question I, wa I wanted to ask as well, I think, if I may, is um, uh, this kind of, have you seen this research uh, around the world? Um, you know, I, I think of low-lying areas, um, the Netherlands specifically, not far from where I spent most of my life. And, and um, have, have there been any lessons, um, and, and uh, you know, or any impetus to do this from uh, places where we we can actually learn some things? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good uh, question. We uh, we looked at uh, what happened internationally and and uh, with the opt with the understanding of uh, what can we learn, what has been learned elsewhere. So uh, absolutely, the Netherlands are on the forefront of this problem. Um, other places around the world, I'm thinking of of Miami, uh, where the water is. Uh, if there's a bit of rain in Miami, you would you would see the water coming out of the street uh, as there's no way for for the water to to escape. It is quite uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to see. Um, and uh, they, we also tried to look at some impact of, the, of what we call climate change on, on the property market. Um, it is quite difficult um, to, uh, to read uh, the impact of the weather, of changes of weather compared to our Australian market, which is extremely dynamic. So uh, on one hand, we've got a set of data, which is the Australian market expanding, growing, and a lot of uh, uh, elements which are uh, rich. Uh, to discuss that my colleague Elisa does, but um, the climate data is is uh, on a obviously on a on a on a slower process, so it's very hard to be able to link the two. Uh, the only thing I can say is that there has been a study in the U.S. that uh, seems to demonstrate that there is an impact with uh, climate change and um, and uh, coastal properties. Um, uh, not just coastal properties, by the way, but uh, along the east coast of, of the US. Okay. Um, following on that, and, and um, putting two of the questions together, which are, I think have a similar theme, and um, uh, as this uh, anonymous attendee says, that many of the locations you talked about are retiree destinations uh, who don't have as, uh, you know, make it difficult for them to physically to relocate, let alone financially. Um, but then merge that in with, with uh, Sam Paul's question about, is there any general advice that can be given to people purchasing along the coast? Um, uh, it, it, I suppose it boils down to that, you know, what should we be doing um, when it comes to 
where we build houses or where we look to buy property. Yeah, so it's it's a very good point. Uh, again, at CoreLogic, we've noticed that um, what we call lifestyle suburbs, uh, which are suburbs where people want to live for obvious reasons. Um, uh, they, we've noticed, obviously, um, even through uh, the COVID crisis, that uh, the average um, price of, uh, of a property has increased significantly for all these lifestyle suburbs. So um, again, it's one of these compounding factor that makes um, you know, th those value uh, being at risk uh, uh, that have increased significantly recently. What to do about it? Uh, I'm well. Again, it's a bit of a outside the, uh, our scope. Um, uh, again, it's I think uh, something for the community and the society to, to think about. But uh, the fact that you made the data available, I think, is um, if people didn't know it, it sort of brings it home to them. Um, I think we're sort of be, you're getting round to, to to winding up now. And again, I'll say, uh, Pierre, thank you very much. I think the, the webinar has been brilliant, and a testimony to that has been the number of questions. Um, and, and I, you know, we will get round to um, all of them and, and answer them personally um, uh, to the members who have taken the time out this lunchtime to, to take part in the webinar. So thank you to them as well. Um, you know, going forward, I. I I wonder if we, um, you know, we'll be, we, I don't think, well, we'll have to wait for 30 years to um, have, a, have an update on, on this. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure that we'd, we'd be like to, um, to get more from you and from CoreLogic, uh, you know, coming up in, in, uh, in other webinars, which we have with Fincia. Um, the next of which is um, uh, next Tuesday when we have uh, a, a really uh, important eminent cast talking about uh, uh, principles versus uh, prescriptive legislation uh, re regulation. Um, that's a, a morning session. If anybody want, hasn't um, signed up for that and does want to, uh, I would recommend that as well. But um, while I'm still on with Pierre, um, is there anything else that you would like to um, finish up on that we haven't missed? It? It's been uh, we've covered so much. Um, I will say that the uh, slides will be available and. Um, um, and we will get round to answering any questions that um, uh, we haven't done so far. Um, so yeah, over to you, Pierre, for one final word, if that if you wanted to. No, thank you. I mean, uh, we, we we would like to uh, to thank uh, Fincia for the invitation, and uh, I'm glad there was uh, a lot of interest in that topic. So it was a pleasure for uh, for us to uh, really participate at that uh, at that webinar. Brilliant. Again, thank you. And um, uh, we, we look forward to many more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.